Chapter 14, Southern Empire, Southern Seas, 1200 to 1500. So we're getting towards the end of the class here. Our class goes through, I believe it's 1550, the 15th, the 1500s, 16th century. Uh, so the categories in our chapter, and we've seen all these places before, so we are not reviewing. We're just going back to see where they're at later on in our timeline. Uh, so we've, we've been to all these places before, and some of this will be review. But understand how these things keep going through all these generations. Many times you know, things don't change that much. Even though progress and technology advances, some of the things that have been around forever are still around even today. Okay, our categories, tropical Africa and Asia, new Islamic empires, Indian Ocean trade, social and cultural change, and the Western Hemisphere. Okay, an important source of, of information that scholars, historians look to uh, regarding this era, specifically in the Muslim states, is, is Ibn Battuta. So Ibn uh, went on his travels when he was uh, 20 years old, 1325. His inspiration was to go on a Hajj. If you remember what a Hajj is, back from, I believe, it's chapter 7, a pilgrimage to Mecca. Uh, he, his traveling went on for 29 years, and he covered 75,000 miles. So he, he kept going. He liked it so much, he didn't want to stop. Uh, and he ends, he ends up visiting the equivalent of 44 modern countries, which were then mostly under the governments of Muslim leaders. So a huge source, of, you know, primary source for us are his writings. According to your book, Ibn, a Moroccan Muslim scholar, the most widely traveled individual of his time, he wrote a detailed account of his visits to Islamic lands from China to Spain and the Western Sudan. So all he was trying to do was go on a pilgrimage to Mecca, and we, and we know that was expected of Muslims then and now, at least once in your life, this Hajj. But then he goes on a tour of all the major trading cities of that time. So he travels for 27 years. Um, this is just a six-year, uh, you know, clip of that to give you an idea of the, of the you know, places he went in, in, in a short time. Across North Africa to Cairo, many times pronounced Cairo. That's probably a westernized pronunciation of it. In Cairo, Cairo to Jerusalem, Damascus, Medina, and Mecca. We know these places, especially Medina and Mecca. The Hajj, his pilgrimage from Medina to Mecca. Uh, Iraq and Persia, the Red Sea to East Africa and the Arabian Sea. Anatolia. But he also went on, went to East Asia, India, China, uh, Southeast Asia. Muslim Spain, or the Iberian Peninsula, we talked about last chapter. This is before Ferdinand and Isabella drove them out. He went to Muslim Spain before that. He also went to the very wealthy uh, traders in the sub-Saharan West Africa, beneath, or I should say below the uh, Saharan Desert. Take our next break, and please watch the film Ibn Battuta, The Greatest Traveler in History, and then come on back. Okay, he, he wrote a very famous book entitled, you guessed it, The Travels of Ibn Battuta. So this is very much like another Marco Polo. He's considered to be the Arabic equivalent of Marco Polo. So these two are compared uh, constantly in, in history. Uh, and like Marco Polo, he became very popular and has become the go-to primary source for information on these lands of this era, specifically uh, the Muslim world at that time. Okay, our next section, Tropical Africa and Asia. How did environmental, di environmental differences sh shape cultural differences in Tropical Africa and Asia? So we've talked about the tropics before, the Tropic of Cancer to the North, the Tropic of Capricorn to the South. This band uh, you know, that, that, that uh, surrounds the equator it goes around the entire world. This is a world map. So this is a, a round world flattened out for a map, right? Uh, so because of their proximity to the equator, it, it's, it's the warmest part of the world. And it's the part of the world that, that gets the most sun. Uh, so, for example, if you're talking about uh, northern Europe and, and across uh, Russia to the north and, and Canada, you know, in the in the winter time, the the Earth tilts away from the sun. It, in some in some cases, these these very northern areas don't get any sun at all during the winter. And the same thing down here in Antarctica when it, turn, when it goes the other way. But in the tropics, whether you're 
whether you're rotating to the north or the south, you stay in the sun year round. That's why they're called the tropics. According to your book, equatorial region between the Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn is characterized by generally warmer hot temperatures year round, though much variation exists due to altitude and other factors. Temperate zones north and south of the tropics generally have a winter season. So, so variations exist. So, for example, uh, the Andes Mountains in Peru are in the tropics, but yet they might be, you know, uh, 15, 16,000 feet or, or even taller. Okay. Uh, so it's cold up there. So you be in the tropics, you're so high up that, that you do get a, get a cold or, or, or a winter. Okay. Uh, there are extreme geographical features in the tropics, rainforests, the deserts, the mountain ranges, and this results in extreme climate variations. So please watch the film, The Tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, and then come on back. Okay. Uh, so the tropics are a very warm region year-round because of its location near the equator. And most of Africa lies in the tropic zone. India, mainland Southeast Asia, also the Southeast Islands in the Pacific, Southern Pacific. Uh, in the Western Hemisphere, the region known as Mesoamerica, where the Aztecs and, and the Mayans were, that would be Southern Mexico and Central America today. <clears throat> so looking at these areas, their environments were governed by specific wind patterns across the oceans, as well as heavy rainfall. Okay. Um, you, you add a fertile river valley to the mix, you have a growing machine. And this goes back to chapter one. We talked about the beginnings of human settlements and civilizations around, around these fertile river valleys. This concept continues throughout history and continues even to this day. Okay, so you remember we saw a film uh, a few chapters back about why China's population is so large. And so this is why, because food is abundant in areas like this with warmth, no winter, and a lot of rain. And you know, it's a, it's a renewable environment and food is, is grown, grown abundantly. And people like to be around lots of foods that they come. Uh, this is partly why China's population was so large and, and exponentially grows, okay? Okay, moving in a little bit different direction, let's talk about the wind. So, so interesting, an interesting geographical kind of phenomenon, winds, move in a kind of rotate in a clockwise direction north of the equator. So any kind of winds that are north of the equator will, will rotate counter, uh, I'm sorry, will rotate clockwise. And that's called an anticyclone. Uh, south of the equator, winds uh, rotate counterclockwise. Uh, that's called a cyclone. <clears throat> so what is a cyclone in meteorology or the study of weather? A cyclone is a large-scale air mass that rotates around strong centers of low pressure. This is usually characterized by inward spiraling winds that rotate counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere of the Earth. Most large-scale cyclonic circulations are centered on low on areas of low atmospheric pressure. So one of these wind patterns that occur in the Indian Ocean in this tropic zone is called a monsoon. And this is like a like a cyclone, a different type of wind pattern. And we've talked about monsoons before. What are they? Seasonal winds in the Indian Ocean caused by the difference in temperature between the rapidly heating and cooling land masses of Africa and Asia and the slowly changing ocean waters. <clears throat> These strongly predictable winds have long been ridden across the open seas by sailors and the large amounts of rainfall that they deposit in parts of India, Southeast Asia, and China allow for the cultivation of several crops a year. So if you, if you recall, these are the strong wind currents that help propel uh, trading vessels across the Indian Ocean. Uh, so they, they, they switch directions depending on what time of year it is. So, you know, one, one time of the year they're going south, and it's it's kind of a dry wind because it's coming across the Himalayan Himalayan mountains or Himalayas, and then when it turns, it comes it comes and it and it dumps rain. Okay, so this is this is a this is a a pattern that 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 you can rely on, and of course travel and agriculture is dictated by by this monsoon. So you remember the men sometimes would have to wait in a foreign port until the monsoon wind would would shift to blow them home. Okay, so we've talked about this before. 
So, so meteor meteor meteorological can't say that word very well. Systems are key to the tropics: wind, storms, heat, much rain. Okay. Okay. What is a sultanate? A state or country governed by a sultan. So, what's a sultan? The sultans of the Ottoman Empire. This would be present-day Turkey, Turkish, who were all members of the Ottoman dynasty and ruled over their transcontinental empire from its perceived inception in 1299 to its dissolution in 1922. So less than 100 years ago, these people were still here. Uh, the Ottoman Empire is really more of a modern day empire, probably is more of a world history two uh, subject, but it starts in our era, 1299. Uh, so we've had a, We've had a polis, a caliph, a khan, now a sultan, and, and 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 we have and we have these these words caliphate, khanate, shogunate, sultanate, as as well as poleis. I should have put in there. <clears throat> uh, so one of the more famous and important sultanates were was called the Delhi Sultanate. Okay, uh, established in the late 1100s. Sultan, of course, like we learn, equals Muslim ruler. They defeated the Hindu armies in India and made Delhi the capital. This marked the beginning of Muslim rule in India. This is this is kind of um, a review. So you can't. This is an awful slide. I'm sorry, but but Delhi is right here. Okay. Um, the the Delhi the the, uh, the Delhi Sultan. It was established by Muslim invaders from Afghanistan, and when they conquered the Hindu people of northern India. So according to your book, the Delhi, the Delhi Sultanate, a centralized Indian empire of varying extent created by Muslim invaders. Uh, so looking at the map, and that's a little bit clearer of the of same same image, but clearer. That's that's Delhi right here, the city. Of course, the entire Delhi Sultanate is is all that kind of brownish color there. Okay. Um, so a Muslim sultanate based mostly in Delhi, it stretched over large parts of the Indian subcontinent. This is the Indian subcontinent, the entirety of the country of India. We've talked about that before. Uh, the sultanates st stretched over India for 320 years, 1206 to 1526. So we'll, we'll talk more in detail about the Delhi sultanate in the next section. I know you're dying to hear. Uh, so people in the tropics were like everyone else. In a sense, they survived by hunting, gathering, herding, but especially farming in an agricultural wonderland. Uh, and we, again, we go back to our fertile river valleys. <clears throat> you, you can't, you can't get away from that. Uh, so back to the peoples that prosper from these valleys. The, the keystone, it appears, to the human condition. Success and survival depended heavily on these rivers, as well as the irrigation system that they devised. And I've mentioned many times that that also indicates that they were they were advanced peoples and having math and engineering skills. Okay, uh, all of this led to an increase in technology gained from the experience of simply building them. Many times people learn how to do something just by by starting and trying it, and you, and you learn ways to do it. Uh, we know that precious metals were among the popular commodities, and, and they continue to be so in this era, traded along the trade routes, same trade routes, Silk Roads and so on, in Asia and Africa. Uh, I've mentioned many times how wealthy the West African traders were. Um, okay, our next section, New Islamic Empires. Under what circumstances did the first Islamic empires arise in Africa and India? Okay, so I mentioned back in our chapter about Islam. Uh, the, the emergence of Islam happened peacefully for the most part as it spread across the lands by traders on the old trade routes, trading goods and ideas as well as religious ideologies, uh, including sub-Saharan societies. So that one, one of them is the Mali Empire. So what was the, who were they? An empire created by indigenous Muslims in Western Sudan of West Africa from the 13th to 15th century, famous for its role in the Trans-Saharan gold trade, Trans-Saharan trade with camels and oases, right? Remember that? 
that's that's who we're talking about okay so so Mali you see here is on in the west western Africa and comes pretty pretty deeply inland uh, coastal as well as all the way inland but but right on the border of that desert and of course right there are the trade centers to get to the European market so this becomes a very important um, empire of that time uh, so they're they're living in that in that savanna grasslands like the Sahel we talked about before, the grasslands between the Sahara Desert to the north and the coastal rainforest in the south. Uh, at its height, Mali encompassed the territory between the Atlantic Ocean and Central Africa, you see on the map there, a distance of nearly 1,800 miles. Uh, strategically located along the Niger River um, floodplain uh, between the West African gold mines and this agriculturally rich floodplain. So there you see the uh, there you see the Niger River, and of course that's our our fertile river valley civilization right there. Okay. Um, let's see. So, so Mali started as a series of small trading states that tried to control the salt and gold trade. Uh, later slaves. Um, they depended on the dominance of the trade routes to gain and retain power. If, if you rule the trade routes, then you, you're going to get all the wealth. And we've talked about that many times. Also, of course, agriculture always was, was a very important aspect of their survival and success. So the, the Mansa would be the, the, the ruler, would rule over 400 cities, towns, and villages of various ethnic, ethnic, ethnicities, sorry, and control the population of approximately 20 million people at its height. So what is a Mansa? It's a Mandinka word meaning king of kings or emperor is, is associated with the Mali Empire. The powers of the Mansa included the right to dispense justice, to monopolize trade, of course, and particularly in gold. <clears throat> uh, the Malian army numbered 100,000 men, including 10,000 cavalry. Uh, during this time, only the Mongol Empire at its height uh, exceeded Mali in size. Uh, the the Mansa reserved the exclusive right to dispense justice and to tax both local and international trade from the popular trade center in Timbuktu. So you may have heard that I'm going to Timbuktu as a joke. This is this is a real a, a real city even today, but but a very important uh, trade center in history in Africa. Uh, Timbuktu is considered by the Western world as one of those cities of adventure. Remember that back to that Orientalism idea, the, the exotic Orient, mysterious, unusual. Uh, let's take a break here and watch our next film. Please watch the film entitled The Legend of Timbuktu and come on back. Okay, so were the Malians able to reach the Americas before Columbus, like the film suggests? Is it possible that Africans made it here before white Europeans? And this is a subject of much study, and there's some evidence that perhaps has happened, but it has not yet been proven. One of the more famous Mansas was Mansa Musa, richest person in world history. So I've probably mentioned him before. If you were to bring his wealth into today's dollars, he would far exceed anybody that, uh, that has wealth today. <clears throat> this was a very, very wealthy man. Uh, so Mansa Kankan Musa, the most famous of the Malian empires, 1300s. Uh, one, at, at one point, he made an elaborate pilgrimage to Mecca, because that's what you're expected to do. Uh, he, he brought thousands of followers and hundreds of camels carrying gold. This man had more gold than, than you could possibly imagine. He didn't know what to do with all of it. Uh, so through this very highly publicized pilgrimage, people came out to see him and, and his, and his uh, caravan. And he simply gave his gold away in huge numbers, many times to poor people, but also rich people. He just gave it away. He didn't care. He was indiscriminate. Here's a handful for you, a handful for you. He had so much of it. Uh, so, so the uh, Mali and Mansa Musa became famous throughout the known world because of their extremely vast wealth that, that nobody could match. 
So again, going back to that, that idea of African civilizations are primitive compared to European, not exactly. This is an example of a very, very advanced society that, that had control over a whole lot of the of the uh, air area and completely dominated trade. So because he gave away so much gold, the value of gold plummeted everywhere he went. You know, one of the re one of the things that makes gold, um, you know, uh, uh, well, you, you you gain wealth from it is because it's rare. If you have a handful of gold, that's pretty nice. But if you have, you know, three semi trucks full, the price is going to drop because you got a lot of it now. You know, supply and demand. When the supply goes down, you know, the price goes goes down and so on. I'm sorry, I said that. I said it the wrong way. When, when everyone wants it, the price goes up. Nobody wants it, the price goes down. So when you have a handful, it's rare. Three semi trucks full is not rare. So the, so what happened everywhere he went because he gave away so much so much gold. The value of gold plummeted uh, because there was an abundance of gold. So um, prices drop when there's a huge supply of something. Let's go to our next film and watch a crash course film about Mansa Musa. Please watch Mansa Musa and Islam in Africa crash course, world history number 16. Go ahead and watch that film and then come on back. Okay, so Mali reached its height, heights as a civilization under Mansa Musa, but declined under his successors. And we've heard this how many times now after his death. So once he was gone, the, 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 the power diminished. Mali's power weakened, but also palace intrigue prevented an orderly succession of imperial power. This happens a lot, you know, uh, in insider politics and backstabbing. Um, I'm talking figuratively here, not literally, but all, all of that may have happened too. Uh, so this this results in smaller states breaking free of its rule to to get their piece of the salt and gold trade. So we've seen this before. Power, you know, there's a there's a there's a, uh, a vacuum that comes from the from the lost power, and other other people jump in to try to get their get their piece. Okay, and so power began to shift to the east, and you have the people called the 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 uh, Tuaregs, nomadic peoples north of Mali. They seized Timbuktu. The Tuaregs uh, principally inhabited a vast area of the Sahara. So they're, they're living in the, in the Sahara north. Okay? These are nomadic pastoralists. Uh, the seizure of one of Mali's trading centers, Timbuktu, had enormous commercial and psychological consequences. This is the center. This is, the, this is like Rome falling. Uh, a relatively small but united group had occupied the richest city in the empire and one of the major sources of, of imperial wealth. So the so the Tuaregs come in and kind of take this over. Okay. Um, so please let's go to our next let's watch another short film here about this conflict. This this film covers their history a little, including who they are today. Please watch the film entitled The Origins of Mali's Tuareg Conflict. And then come on back. So much like the shock the Romans received from the invasion of the Visigoths, the, the fall of Timbuktu is shocking. Okay. Okay, beginning in, in 1502, the Sungai forces uh, took control of virtually all of Mali's eastern possession, including the, the sites for commercial exchange, as well as the gold and copper mines at the southern and northern borders. Uh, so an effort to form an alliance with the Portuguese failed to stop the Sun Guys' advances. I'm talking about the the uh, Mali and Portugal tried to come together, but it failed. In 1545, a Sun Guy army routed the Malians. Al although the Sun Guy never conquered what remained of the Empire of Mali, uh, its victories effectively ended uh, Malian power in the savannah. So I mentioned the the Delhi Sultanate before. Um, let, let's, I told you we come back to this. So Muslim Sultanate based mostly in Delhi, uh, which of course that's that, that's that lousy slide again. That That's right here. Okay, that right there. And the entirety of the brown is the Delhi Sultanate. Uh, okay. Um, so this is a, like I said, a stretch over large parts of the continent became recognized as a Muslim uh, realm. Um, 
uh, and they began as an aggressive and, and brutal people, but then shifted to become more benevolent. So we've seen this a couple times, but not very often. You don't see that much. Uh, your book talks about a woman who became the sultan, historically the only woman to have done so, uh, becoming the sultana of the Delhi Sultanate. So who who is this who is this person? Uh, the Sultan Iltutmish Razia is her name, shocked everyone. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I gave you the wrong information. That's her father's name. So her, her name is Razia. The Sultan Iltutmish is her father. Uh, he shocked everyone when he named his daughter uh, Razia to be named the new Sultan or Sultana. So why would he do that in an era that didn't, didn't really recognize women as, as, you know, having any kind of, you know, um, leadership abilities or even even having an opinion why would he do that uh my sons are devoted to the pleasures of youth no one of them is qualified to be king there is no one more competent to guide the state than my daughter wow so not very often do you see that but but although a worthy leader her her reign lasted for only four years <clears throat> this is an account from her story from that era uh Sultan Razia was a great monarch. She was wise, just, and generous, a benefactor to her kingdom, a dispenser of justice, the protector of her subjects, and the leader of their armies. She was endowed with all the qualities befitting a king, but she was not born of the right sex. And so, in the estimation of men, all these virtues were worthless. May God have mercy on her. Wow. Even if you do a good job, even if you're a, a great uh, sultan, sultana, it didn't matter. You, you weren't what anybody wanted, because, well, what men wanted, because you were a woman. So even though she was considered a great leader over her frivolous brothers, she still was not accepted because she was a woman. So we, we've, we've seen this before. Hatshepsut, remember the, the, uh, the pharaoh of Egypt, chapter 2. Uh, she ruled when her son was too young. She became the pharaoh, ruled well for a period. But after her death, all evidence of her was destroyed to save Egypt the embarrassment of a female ruler in history. So misogyny or, or you know, hatred of women or abuse of women uh, or the condensation of women is a huge part of world history, even into our modern times. In comparison, the... The male sultans ruled very harshly in comparison to Razia. Uh, they ruled by force and domination. They would pillage and, and loot. They ruled with a heavy hand. Cruel the people, abused women, uh, heavy taxation. Uh, they relied on force to keep the people subservient and obedient. They used their military quickly to put down rebellions. Uh, no negotiation. They were just they just came at you hard. Um, why why so why so brutal? Um, to all this to keep the sultans themselves in luxury and power. Uh, so their rule was based on wickedness and depravity. Uh, the fall of the Delhi Sultanate, and we've heard this a lot before. No definite law of succession. After the death of each sultan, the situation gave rise to many civil wars, looking for that right person to come up and take charge and, and bring everybody under their control. Uh, the nobles became the king makers who controlled the weak sultans. The Yadmir system gave rise to disintegration that weakened the kingdom. The invasion of Timur and Babur was the main cause for the downfall of the Delhi Sultanate. As the Sultanate weakened, the Mongols smelled blood. Always those darn Mongols. And they swooped in under Timur. We talked about Timur back in chapter 12. And they come in, uh, and ultimately this, the Delhi Sultanate fell. The Mongols fell from internal struggles and intense pressure from rival states. Okay, that is the end of chapter 14, part one. Uh, please go to chapter 14, part two. Thank you.